So it's finally here, the last week of October, the week that we've all been waiting for as deer hunters, that week where bucks are walking around more during daylight and they're more concerned about finding that first hot estrus doe rather than looking in trees in high hunting pressured areas for hunters. In this video, what I want to cover is the difference between a morning stand, an evening stand, and an early season stand, and a rut phase stand. It seems as though there's a little bit of confusion as to what stands you should hunt when, and why you should stay out of other stands until a certain period of time. Got a couple of properties I want to show you as an example. So right here we have 160 acres. This is pretty much in wilderness country up in northern Michigan somewhere. This property right here was purchased by a landowner about a year or so before he called me up. He wanted me to come out and do a habitat plan and a hunting strategy for him because uh, they were scratching their heads a little bit as to what they should do with this big 20 acre field. The previous owner had planted food in here before. He had square sections in here and he had like brassicas in one section. He had clover down in here and the new landowner didn't know whether or not he should plant corn or what he should do. and they were having real issues on trying to get from the northern part of the property, which their barn is right up here in the northwest corner. This picture is about uh, four or five years old, so the barn's not on the picture yet, but they were having real issues on getting from over here down to this section here without spooking deer. Uh, they found that when they walked through the field, you know, they would be bumping deer out in the morning. So then they would come down through this trail right through here through the middle of the woods, but then they found that they were blowing all the deer out in this bedding area in the afternoon so that really didn't work out very well either you know we got a lot of cattails over in here we got this beaver dam and you know a lot of swamp a lot of cattails a lot of swamp grass over here on the east side of the property it's pretty much always wet you can see there's a little crick going right down through here so they didn't really know how they could access this or when they should access this because they knew there was some big bucks bedded in this area and they really only had access on two sides. They had the road that was up on the north edge, and then they had this gas line that was uh, opened up and mowed here on the south line. So they could, they could walk down through here as well. This is a neighbor over here that did a lot of hunting. This is uh, some pretty thick stuff over here. And so, you know, they didn't know if they should come down through the woods or if they come down through the edge of the field. And they figured, you know, before we put a lot of work into this and screw things up, they decided to give me a call and just see if I could help point them in the right direction so that they can all get on the same page and move their property forward. So in 2019, I showed up to scout the land with the property owner along with his son and a friend of his. I marked a lot of features that were on the property. It's pretty flat, uh, not very much uh, topography involved at all. I could see the issues they had because outside of this field, there really wasn't much food in the woods. It was a lot of conifers, as you can see. This picture was taken with no leaf cover, but yet it's pretty green. So there's a lot of pine, uh, spruce, there's a lot of fir. And then any deciduous trees in here was pretty much soft with like uh, aspen, birch, poplar, soft maple. But what I really liked about this property is that it had this big, huge 20-acre uh, field in the center of the property which is just going to be awesome for a for a center property destination field. I mean, you can't almost ask for anything better. So a few days after walking the property, I came up with a habitat plan and a hunting strategy for the landowner. And this is what the habitat plan looks like. And so first of all, this 20 acre field looks like it's been broken up in a pretty unconventional way. And there's a reason for it. And that is we want to have as many deer out here without all that social stress because uh, 20 deer in a big wide open food plot is not uh, exactly a safe place for mature bucks to want to hang out right I mean they're gonna feel like they're standing out on a 50 yard line so we definitely had to break this thing up so what you see here in all these yellow areas here this is planted switchgrass really heavy that around uh, 10 to 11 pounds per acre which means that they're probably not gonna want to bed in it with switchgrass that's that thick and, and what we did is we broke up a lot of this uh, food plot with that switchgrass. We've got a corner here that's got a switchgrass screen. We got this one acre field right down here that was already in clover. We sectioned that off with some switchgrass. We took the corner over here. We sectioned that off with some switchgrass. And then we've got grains and brassicas over here. And we got grains over here in these corner plots. Uh, that's what the G stands for. The B is for brassicas, obviously. 
Now, the reason why these are white is because these are going to be grains every year, but the orange letters of grains and brassicas are gonna be rotated. So, so next year, this would be brassicas and this would be grains. The same over here, this would be rotated. The dark stuff that you see all the way around the outside is a strip of clover. That clover can be anywhere from you know, five yards wide up to 10 yards wide if they wanted to, but have a nice little clover strip all the way around the outside. That's gonna allow them to access all the way around the field real easily, like in the springtime when the field is wet. That clover strip is gonna be green the whole season and will give them a lot better access. It's also gonna allow these bucks to make scrapes in the clover instead of uh, trying to make scrapes in brassicas, which really doesn't work out very well. So all these overhanging branches along the edges are gonna be over top of the clover. And then we have more switchgrass strips that are gonna separate the brassicas from the grains. So you can have multiple deer out in this field and a lot of them can't even see each other. So gonna be able to pack more deer into a 20 acre field than if it was just left wide open, right? And then we've got this uh, center green section right here. It looks like it got that brick wall pattern to it. Well, really what that is, is uh, that's long-term screening. Um, this is gonna be more woody uh, type screening, maybe like hybrid willows, or you could even plant a few white pine trees in here. Um, if they wanted to just do annual sorghum every year, they could do that. Or if they wanted to do perennial miscanthus grass, they could do that too, or a combination of any of those. But really the purpose of it is because these uh, blinds here, and I would recommend putting redneck blinds into, these, uh, into this tall screen, these pine trees and sorghum or miscanthus grass is going to help hide these redneck blinds. And if these things are on 10-foot towers, it's going to allow these guys to be able to get up into the redneck blind without being seen because this uh, screen here is going to be really tall. Same thing down here. We've got another redneck blind down here that's going to be in tall screening. It's going to take a few years for that to happen, but once it's tall enough, they can actually get into these redneck blinds undetected and with the right wind, they can get all the way through this field with a wind that's blowing back toward their barn, right? So so this is really going to allow the deer hunters to get down to the south end of the field in the afternoon when all the deer are in these bedding areas and in the woods there's really no way they can get in from the south right because they're going to blow all the deer out of here so this is going to allow them to get through this field all the way into this redneck blind without being seen with the right wind and then the deer can come out from the bedding areas fill up this field and you know they'll have bow shots into here both shots into here, both shots over into there, and that should work out really well. And then at the end of the day, when it's nighttime out and all the deer are in the field, then they can slip out. Instead of going through the middle of the field and bypassing all these deer that are in here, they can just slip out the back way, come right out into the gas line, and then get out of Dodge that way because after dark, there's no more deer in the woods, right? They're all in the fields. There is a soybean field to the south of this property underneath the picture. And so, you know, deer are either going to be in that soybean field to the south or into this main 20 acre food plot to the north. And this is going to allow them to get out of there. As far as total acres of food in this 20 acre field, this has now been reduced down to 12 acres. So with a 160 acre property, uh, if you were to add up all the food strips in this food plot and then you add up some of the food that's over into here, you're still at about 13, 14 acres of food and that is right at about that 10% of the property. So that's about where you want to be. Um, you know, it's not total wilderness. They do have a soybean field, like I said, to the south. There are some corn fields to the north, but all in all, it's still pretty much a wilderness country. Now, if this property was in an ag setting, say in southern Michigan, you could probably get away with like 5% of the property in food, which would, you know, be down in around that um, five to seven acres. Now, you also see I got a bunch of red stands in here. These stars are hunting locations. So we've got orange stars around the outside, and you can see over here where it's really swampy and hard to get to, these are all red stands. So the orange stars are stand locations where you can hunt any time of the season from October 1 through the end of the year. And the red stars are stand locations where you should only hunt this starting the last week of October, which has just started now. So now they can finally move into these uh, thicker areas where they're right in the middle of bedding 
and then again only with the right wind conditions and they have plenty of locations to be able to hunt a red stand with almost any wind condition. These yellow areas right here with the black lines, these are bedding areas, uh, areas where they can cut trees down and get some sunlight down to the forest floor and just create some more cover down at the deer level. These does are gonna wanna bed close to the food anyway, and that's what these things are just gonna enhance the bedding that's already uh, taken place in these areas. That's gonna leave plenty of room for these bucks to bed where they wanna bed, which is gonna be more in these remote areas next to the beaver dam, out in the swampy areas where there's a lot of cattails and swamp grass. We found lots of lone buck beds back in here. And so with these stands being way back in this bedding area, if you're gonna hunt these, you know, in the later part of October and early November, the only time that you can ever think about getting in here is in the early morning hours and getting in here before the bucks get back to bed. So generally in high hunting pressured areas like this property is, these bucks are gonna be in their beds at least a half hour to an hour before it gets light out. So that means a hunter's gonna to have to get in here before that. So, you know, you're talking what, an hour and a half before it gets light, you're gonna to have to get into these stands and you gotta beat the buck to his bed. Cause if the buck gets there before you do, then you show up, even if it's 10, 15 minutes later, you're gonna bust him out of there and could sour that area for that buck to want to bed there for the rest of that year. So that means that in the afternoon, there's no way that you can hunt these red stands, right? Because it's right in all this bedding and there's no way you can get in here when deer are already bedded. So these are red stands are, are morning spots only. Now there might be a few exceptions to that rule and that would be toward the perimeter of the property. So for instance, this red stand this really is a situation where we've got deer crossing the road right here because the tree line continues to the north of this property. And so these deer are coming along the swamp in the afternoon, they're coming into here. And so you could slip into the stand right here because this is not necessarily a bedding area. This is really a travel corridor, a funnel that crosses the road right here. More of the bedding happens as you get further into the property from what I saw. So. Uh, you could hunt this one in the afternoon, but you would not be able to hunt any of these in the afternoon because the deer are going to be bedded here when you show up in the afternoon. And so for all the other spots that you could hunt in the afternoon would be, say, this orange stand here that's right, on the, right in between these two little food plots here. I've got some red dots in here, which uh, are apple trees. So especially in the early season, which is what an orange stand is, you can catch these deer coming in here from the bedding areas. They're going to file into these food plots and you know this is easy in and out right coming in from the barn you just walk right along here and pop into the stand and just wait for these deer to come into the food plot at the end of the day now you would not want to get into the stand in the morning right because in the morning the deer are going to be in the food plot probably or munching on apples underneath these apple trees and if you show up right before it gets light out in the morning you might bust all the deer out of that food plot and that pretty much is going to turn that food plot nocturnal or you know a lot less daytime deer movement and a lot more nighttime deer movement. Uh, same with this stand right here, really too close to a food plot to hunt this in the morning. You would wanna hunt this in the afternoon. Same with this one. But in the morning, you could hunt these stands right down here because this is not where the deer are going to be when it's dark out in the morning, right? The bucks are gonna be bedded pretty much over here on the east side of the property where we saw a lot of the lone beds over on this side of the property where there's not as much real estate and it's closer to the food, this is where the does are gonna to wanna to bed. And the beds that we saw here, there were multiple beds, which means that it's a doe family. So by being that invisible hunter, you're gonna give these deer the illusion that this property is not being hunted because very rarely are you ever bumping any deer on this property. And so in case you're wondering, these little uh, black and yellow lines right here, these are barriers with uh, hinge cut trees and so what you're doing is you're just restricting the deer movement through these little openings right here. Now these openings are about 30 to 40 yards wide. And if you put a stand right here on the end of one of the barriers, you can pretty much cover this whole distance here with a bow. And then we have another barrier with another opening and then another stand over here on the east side. So with a west wind, you would wanna hunt in this stand here. With an east wind, you would wanna hunt out of the stand right here. Really all it does is just uh, eliminate some of that random deer movement. 
that crosses north and south across the southern border as they head to the soybean field down to the south. So this is just something that you can do to create a lot more predictability on the property. The one thing you have to be careful though is if it's wooded on the other side of the property line where the neighbor might be hunting, you might be creating a pinch point for him as well if he can figure it out. But in this situation, this is an open gas well down here and then it's an open soybean field on the other side of that yet. So there's uh, really no way the landowner is going to be able to uh, capitalize on a funnel situation that you've created here. Over on this side here on the west side you can see that uh, we don't have those tight gate openings here like we do here. These are big wide open spaces where this is not a pinch point funnel. But we did create little barriers right here that's going to make it so that deer can't sneak in behind the hunter. So when he's hunting here with a south wind, deer can pass in front of him on this side but they can't sneak in behind him on this side. So now I just want to give you one more example here of another property that uh, I do hunt from time to time and this is strictly a rut phase hunting property. So this is a situation where we've got a lot of thick cover up in here. There's a bunch of autumn olives, there's uh, even some cattails in here. We got this creek running through here. Uh, we got the current going down this way. That's what these uh, blue arrows for. But then we have another big bedding area down in over here. This is, it's just really thick in here, almost impossible to walk through, but man, the deer, they just, uh, they just love it down in here. So uh, what they do though, is there's this uh, main trail that runs kind of a, right along this creek here and goes from one bedding area to the other. And that's what this uh, yellow dotted line is. And I've got a lot of trail cam videos of deer going up and down this trail. And it's a pretty predictable trail. And the distance between the end of this yellow dotted line from the top all the way to the bottom in a straight line is about 600 to 650 yards. So this is quite a distance. And what I do is I will come in right from the power lines right here and I'll sneak in about 150 yards through this open area. Now this open area right here you can see it's, it's not much vegetation. This is mainly cool season grasses which means that these grasses are pretty short. There's not a lot of uh, bedding cover in these areas. And so because this is not a bedding area, that allows me to and sneak into here and just wait for these bucks to come from this bedding area and cruising along the creek to search out for hot estrus does up in this bedding area or vice versa. So some of you guys have heard me say in the past that sometimes I don't get into my rut hunting stands until like eight o'clock or 8.30 in the morning, which is well after it gets light out. Well. The reason I can do that is because let's say I'm hunting a bedding area down in here and I get into this stand down here say at uh, quarter to six or 5.30 in the morning because I'm going into a bedding area, right? And so I've got to get into this stand before the bucks do. And then let's say the next day I climb into this stand right here same time about 5.30 in the morning because I got to beat the bucks to their beds, right? And so by the third morning, I'm getting kind of burned out, right? I'm pretty tired. I don't feel like getting up that early again for a third morning in a row. That's when I'll climb into this stand at around 8 or 8.30 so I can sleep in a little bit. And the reason I can do that is because I can just slip in where there's no bedding going on. This is strictly a travel corridor. And what happens during the pre-rut, say in that late October, early November time frame, is you've got all these big bucks that are bedded in their in their secluded bedding areas and it's like they're waiting for the does to bed down after they get done feeding so around eight o'clock eight thirty the does start filing into their bedding areas and they're bedding down and that's when these big bucks get up on their feet and they start searching all the known bedding areas for hot estrus does in my experience over many years of hunting the pre-rut like this tells me that the mature buck action really doesn't heat up until about 9 30 to 10 o'clock in the morning once we get to that 10 o'clock time frame that's when i'm alert and because i've only been to my stand for about an hour or an hour and a half i'm not overly tired i'm alert and i'm ready to go and i can easily sit till one o'clock in the afternoon since i got into that blind at eight o'clock instead of 5 30 right and so the two wind directions that I would love to hunt this stand would be a north wind or a south wind. Now, a lot of guys might think that I would want to hunt this with a west wind, right? With the wind blowing away from the deer trail back toward the power line. But what I like to do is I like to hunt with the wind that's in the favor of the mature buck. So if you got a mature buck down here in this bedding area, 
whether he comes out of here or he comes out of one of these bedding areas down here, he's going to end up on one of these two trails eventually, and he's going to start heading north pretty much through the only trail that is going to take him up to this bedding area. And if we have a wind coming out of the north in this direction, then he can come up from the other way, and he's traveling with his nose into the wind, and he is scent checking everything in front of him before he gets there. That's a real safe scenario for him. And because I'm just off to the right a little bit, my scent stream is paralleling his trail, and there's no way that he can pick me up. This is a perfect scenario because this crick kind of pushes these deer off to the right a little bit, a little bit closer to the power line. I can just slip in real easy into a tree here, and they are never going to pick up my wind. Now, the other interesting thing that I just wanted to point out, and I've not done this yet because I... I've not been able to figure out how to cross the creek right here to get to the stand, but let's say I was on the left side of the creek here, and you know, remember we got the water flowing from north to south. So if we've got a north wind, and I'm in this tree right here, you would think that my north wind would cross the creek and be right into the duck's nose right here as he's coming north. But what happens is because this uh, creek is flowing, that water is gonna pick up my scent stream because the, the water is actually going to create an air current right down in this creek bed. And once my scent gets over top of the water, the water will carry my scent and keep it right above the water inside that creek bed. And it'll never cross and get to this deer trail. So that's something that you just might want to think about. Just a, a little thing there that you can remember how you can use cricks and river systems to your advantage when it comes to trying to stay scent safe. Now some guys would maybe never do this, but I will even hunt this stand with an east wind. So if we got a wind that's coming from the power lines and blowing across my stand right toward the trail, I would have no problem with hunting that. And the reason is, is because if my scent stream is going right at the trail, by the time a buck comes down from the north or he comes up from the south, by the time he hits my scent stream straight to my west, it's gonna be too late. I will have already seen him coming. I've already got my arrow drawn back and if he stops and he gets nervous about smelling my scent it's already too late I'm already going to have that arrow on its way but I really don't even worry about that too much anymore because uh, I've just become more and more obsessed with my scent control and I've had several deer already this year downwind of me and barely even raise their noses and uh, if they did smell anything it's, it's so negligible that it, they must think that I'm further away than what I really am. So I'm real happy about my level of scent control and, and pretty much now anymore, I don't even worry about which way the wind is blowing. And uh, I would almost rather sit in a stand with the wind blowing in the direction I expect the buck to come because uh, if, if it's in his advantage, there's gonna be more chance of him coming up that trail in that situation. Oh, and the other reason I like an east wind in this situation blowing from the power lines to the trail is because as this buck is cruising up along this creek here, he doesn't really have to worry about any danger coming from the creek side, right? Because there's hardly any real estate between his trail and the creek. All he needs to worry about is this big open area here uh, between him and the power lines. Well, with that east wind, he's going to be able to scent check all this area as he walks up and down this trail. So if you've been wondering the difference between a morning stand and an evening stand or an early rut season stand, hopefully this video has been helpful to you and you'll be able to apply some of these strategies in your hunting this year. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this with some of these tips, uh, just be sure to like and subscribe and you'll get updates as I release them. So good hunting the rest of the season and I'll see you on the next video.